disappear. The anti-immigration rhetoric, we aren't allowed to kid ourselves that it doesn't necessarily come from within the kind of fascist movement, that it, but it emanates actually from those who should be aligned or should feel themselves aligned with the labor movement and socialist movement and anti-capitalist movement. So in Greece, even where we have a massive uh, immigration crisis such as in Greece, it isn't necessarily from golden dawn that those discourses and the anti-immigration rhetoric arises, but it is effectively from PASOK, the former uh, the old Social Democratic Party, which in the 2009 elections hung up posters calling, uh, calling for a state of emergency over the crisis of HIV and saying, oh, foreign prostitutes are infecting our Greek men with, H with HIV. The movement on the solar cleaner had grown continually. In 2008, they won the London Living Wage and the Union Recognitions, but that was not enough for them. They actually decided to go for more. Uh, so they continued, they continued the campaign for better working conditions. And in 2011, they shifted the campaign to be brought back in house. Everyone was quite surprised at how these uh, uh, foreigners, these migrant workers, come over here pretending to be brought back in house. But I said, we don't care what you think. We deserve that. We're going to continue fighting about that. And one of the, one of the most important things is the solidarity amongst the cleaners and, and the, the level of organizations. It was unbelievable, and it actually shows, and it, it shows what can be achieved if you actually are determined to have improvement on your terms and conditions. And it also shows how important solidarity across different movements are. The students at SOAS were fantastically supported of the campaign, and also uh, the, the, the lecturers and the SOAS staff. I left a country that had now negotiated independence by the British. We had huge demonstrations in the campaign for independence. We cited across the continents to India, and they didn't get that independence that easily. So we were preparing for it, that the British would come down to the West Indies with troops as they did in India, as they did in Ghana, as they did in Kenya, and killed a lot of Mau Mau people. And the Navy pulled up in the harbor of Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm not talking about some little racial issue between white and black. I'm talking about a time when the whole world was being transformed and that black people, slaves, ex-slaves, had come to the front and said, we are going to be independent or will this world will not have peace at all. Every day as a child, I grew up hearing about the war that killed 45 million people between 1938 and the end of the war. 45 million people were murdered and executed and bombed. And that's the world I grew up in. That's the world my parents tried to explain to me about. And I said, Dad, why do you all listen to the radio at this time every day? And the voice came, this is London calling. This is the voice of the BBC. So I said, well, well, why are we, 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 we so keen on that? He said, there are thousands of West Indians who died in that war. Thousands of West Indians died in the war. Increasingly, thousands died in our movement for independence. And you know why we came to this country? The British used to advertise it on that same BBC program, wanting workers, transport workers, some factory workers. And we were asked, invited to come to England. My name's Linda and I'll be chairing tonight. Um, I, I don't actually live in London, so I'm just a visitor, so please be kind to me. Um, I've been involved in the fight against racism and fascism for over 30 years. And um, in, in Leeds, <coughs> I was a member of the Anti-Nazi League and Rock Against Racism, and I was one of the organisers of the um, Carnival Against Racism, where we got thousands of people out 
on the streets um, against, against racism. And that in itself, that carnival was against the backdrop of all the unrest that was going on all around the country in 1981 uh, that culminated in the riots. Since then, I live in Bristol and, and I've been there seven years and, and there I've been Secretary of the United Against Fascism and, and, and of Music Hate Racism, where we, got, we campaigned against the British National Party and they got the lowest votes ever. And two years ago, the English Defence League came to Bristol to march and we, and we um, you know, all sections of the community came out in the council demonstration as they did in lots of other towns and we humiliated them. Um, both experiences have shown me that um, as black and white and we, and we unite that we can fight and defeat racism in the workplace or on the streets uh, but we have to link the struggles and so we have to look at the racism that goes on in the housing issues and um, and you know police brutality all the workplaces and I know that North London is at the forefront of this community approach um, in light of this I'm really honored to be with these three speakers tonight um, Mark Burfeld is going to speak. He is a member of RS21 and he is um, author of an e-book on Portugal, Portugal 40 years after the revolution. Essegel is going to come here and speak um, as a SOAS striker. And Darkus Howe needs no introduction as a long-time fighter for justice and equality. I'm a West Indian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that the people... Oh, yes. I think saying. the people on this platform can show us that they've fought racism in the past, in the present, and they will fight in the future. So the structure of the meeting is going to be that we'll hear from Mark and Essegel first for a short while, and then we'll open it up to the room to have a discussion on those particular issues that they, that they have raised. Um, and, and then we'll hear Darka speak for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up again for the more specific discussion uh, about, about the issues that Darkus raises. Um, feel free to contribute anything at all. You can ask a question, you can make a contribution, or you could just give your personal experience because we all have a story. Um, okay, so I'll hand it over to Mark to, to yeah. speak. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, thank you first and foremost for inviting me to speak, and particularly Louis uh, for contacting me and tracing me up uh, over a course of a few uh, weeks. I didn't know that I only had eight minutes to speak, but I will try to keep it as brief as possible. Not likely to happen with me, but I will do my best to do that. So first of all, I think the starting point uh, of this talk has to be has to be neo has to be neoliberalism and the kind of devastation that neoliberalism has wreaked upon the planet for several uh, for several decades now. Because I think that if we want to talk about immigration, we need to talk not only about the experiences that we have made over the last couple of years. So for example, me as a German immigrant who came in here in 2006 got some racist remarks, but it doesn't compare in any ways to the kind of racialization, the marginalization, and the ethnicization that other groups of immigrants face on a daily basis. And how can we actually explain those differences that in different ways that migrants are treated? Why isn't it the case that, for example, uh, Cameron or the Tories or UKIP are arguing against Greek migration to Britain, and why are they arguing against Romanian uh, immigration to Britain? What is, what is underlying it? And I think the, some of the question can be partially answered by an analysis of neoliberalism, in which we understand that what has happened inside of the neoliberalism is that it creates the kind of notion of the undeserving poor and the deserving poor, where the welfare state becomes a kind of reward system, that if you abide to certain rules, uh, and you play by the I mean, you play by the game book that you will be awarded uh, welfare. You will be able to continue to live in your in your council uh, council home or or be or access a certain public service. At the same time, it has wrecked devastation upon the global south, and that has been often written out. So since the 1980s, Latin America has been uh, has been devastated by structural adjustment programs or the Washington Consensus. We have seen in particular Mexico, the situation exacerbated through the NAFTA, which explains partially the huge wave of migration to the United States. And we see, for example, Africa devastated, uh, devastated by the IMF. And today we see at our very own doorstep the countries of Greece, Portugal, Italy, uh, and Spain, and even Ireland, being devastated by the same kind of policies perpetrated by, uh, by the Troika. And there's a contradiction in neoliberalism, because on the one hand, it has been based around the notion that capital can move freely, 
and uh, there are no limits anymore to the way that capital can move. It can pull off, it can, it can settle wherever it wants. Yet people, such as the people in the Ukraine, have been suffering under the burden that they haven't been able to move as freely as they might have wished to and are effectively bound, uh, bound by the fate of their passport. And that holds true for millions of people who, want, who are in search for a better life in, on the African continent or in, or in Latin America and are faced with militarized borders that are keeping them away uh, from pursuing, uh, pursuing the, their future. And there is the myth that neoliberalism and globalization have eroded the na national sovereignty, have eroded the, nat have eroded the national state whatsoever. But consistently, when we see what politicians are trying to do, they appeal to national identity in order to mobilize for neoliberal, uh, for neoliberal, uh, neoliberal politics. So we believe, so when the, <clears throat> So when UKIP says, oh, all the laws that are currently being, uh, that Britain is currently governed by, such as the right for prisoners, uh, prisoners to vote inside, uh, in, uh, prisoners to vote are being put forward by Brussels rather than uh, being made in Westminster. At the same time, they're appealing to the idea of national identity and national identities are once mobilized, uh, mobilized again. And the same kind of, in, the same kind of problems the kind of division between the undeserving poor and the deserving poor that neoliberalism has put on, it has put on pop local populations, it has also put on immigration and on, the, on, immigrants coming to, on, on immigrants coming to Britain. And in doing so, it has actually, the notion of Europe today has self-racialized itself. It has meant that European identity is not some kind of progressive idea in many ways, but it effectively is based on the fact that it excludes on the coastline of Africa, it excludes millions of Africans coming, in, uh, coming in, into Europe. It, at the same time, whilst the Syrian, uh, while the Syrian crisis intensifies and people are trying to make their way through Turkey into Bulgaria, into the European Union, it again, draw, it again draws the distinction between those who can seek refuge in Britain or in, Euro, or in the European Union and those, and those who can't. And it actually, if you look at all the immigration figures that have been released recently, it isn't necessarily the fact that they have been, that they have been proportionally or percentage-wise have risen so dramatically and that has exacerbated the problem. What has exacerbated the problems and why we hear about the notion of fortress Europe, why we hear about the very fact that there is a so-called immigration problem is the fact that the borders which they have pulled up in Africa, in Spanish enclaves on the African coast such as Milea or the ones that they have, or in Lesbos in Greece or at those different flashpoints along the Mediterranean coast have become so militarized that the hundreds have died outside of Lampedusa just last year, that we see fences being pulled, pulled up where hundreds of African migrants try to, to which Af thousands of African migrants try to cross in, in a night. And what, and what they're trying to aim towards the, the, the European Union and particularly the national governments which are affected by the first, uh, by the first, uh, by the first uh, wave of migration coming into Europe is effectively that they're, in, that they're putting austerity measures on their local populations which means that they need to, in order to get re-elected, they need to put forward harsher measures toward, uh, towards migrants and create that distinction between those who deserve the kind of welfare that Europe still currently, currently has in store and those who, do, who, don't deser who don't deserve it. How many minutes do I have? Two. Two minutes. So, just to say something very, uh, very briefly, those, the anti-immigration rhetoric, we aren't allowed to kid ourselves that it doesn't necessarily come from within the kind of fascist movements, that it, but it emanates actually from those who should be aligned or should feel themselves aligned with the labor movement and socialist movement and anti-capitalist movement. So in Greece, even where we have a massive uh, immigration crisis such as in Greece, it isn't necessarily from Golden Dawn that those discourses and the anti-immigration rhetoric arises, but it is effectively from PASOK, the former uh, the old Social Democratic Party, which in the 2009 elections hung up posters calling, uh, calling for a state of emergency over the crisis of HIV and saying, oh, foreign prostitutes are infecting our Greek men with, H with HIV. Similarly, Darkus and I were talking about 
Ed Balls' statement on immigration, or if we remind ourselves of Gordon Brown in 2007 calling for British jobs for, uh, for, British, uh, for British workers. And, these, are, and these, uh, these aren't solely anymore on the kind of cultural level, where it previously had been that we cannot live together with Muslims because they are culturally suppo supposedly culturally incompatible, <coughs> incompatible and that mosques supposedly uh, defaced you know, the city skyline of whatever your northern European city. The arguments that are coming from the anti-immigration side are becoming increasingly biologically determinist in so far that you see uh, what has happened in Greece with PASOK that they're talking about uh, HIV, uh, immigrants infe infecting uh, Greek men with HIV. You see Tilo Zarazin, the former chef, uh, bank boss of the Deutsche Bank, uh, talking about how uh, Muslims have the gene which predisposes them to have more children than ordinary Germans. And similar, and similar arguments are making a rise. And I think that, it, of course, there's a link to the crisis, but I think that neoliberalism tries to explain that, explain that more. Now, that doesn't exclude the very fact, and I'll end on, and I'll end on this, that, so for example, some, of, uh, some, uh, uh, some people have Im emigrated from Spain, from Greece, from Portugal, etc., to Northern Europe, and that wave of migration will continue to happen, it doesn't exclude that those will not be <coughs> racialized or, um, or scapegoated over the next coming years. So David Cameron has once stated that if Greece leaves the European Union, it will have to put some kind of halt or quota on, Im on immigration. And those statements are worrying indeed if you, if you think about the consequences that it has had recently with the anti-Romanian and anti-Bulgarian a uh, scare that has been going, uh, going around, uh, around the media. But there are possibilities for a fight back as well. And those are my last, uh, my last words. Immigra immigrants have always been at the backbone of the labor and socialist and anti-capitalist movements. If you look at the <coughs> Brunswick strike that happened in 19, uh, 1977, if you look to the kind of uh, campaigns that have happened in the mid-2000s in the United States, under, the, uh, under George W. Bush, the Si Se Puede movement where uh, Latino immigrants have had been demanding amnesty to remain inside of the United States. And it also has been highlighted recently by the fight over Yashika, an 18-year-old student who was deported back to Mauritius despite being only a few months away from graduating from, from high school. And I think that as the left as socialists organized in our communities, as anti-capitalists inside of, organized inside of the movement, it's important that we construct viable political alternatives and also the kind of, uh, and, uh, disseminate the kind of ideas that can put forward a very different kind of picture of what, what immigration has brought to this country. It has brought resistance, it has brought uh, culture, and most importantly, it has brought the perspective that we're not sim simply alone in this mess against austerity, but that we're fighting this together European-wide, but not only European-wide, but worldwide, because it's only through taking inspiration from the Latin American struggles, only to, through taking inspiration from what has been going on on the African subcontinent, that there's any perspective of seeing an alternative to this rotten system which has been devastating stating us for the last couple of decades. Thanks for that, Mark. You, you will be able to come back at the end if people raise um, yeah, I'm sorry uh, for, for, uh, you know, other issues that you might want to come back on. So we'll move on to Esa Gal. Yes. Um, well, hello, good evening, everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I'm not myself a cleaner, and I haven't actually strike. I'm a, I'm a SOAS, uh, I'm, I'm a cleaner representative of the campaign Chatter for Clean SOAS. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't attend because most of them they got two or three jobs, so for them it's quite difficult to attend this kind of meeting. That's why you bear with me, please. Well, just a brief history of the campaign. The campaign started in 2006. Uh, the cleaners started to organize. There were only two or three of them who actually wanted to organize. But the problem, the, the, everything emerged out of this necessity, actually. Uh, they were stupid over from one company to another, and the, comp the new company did, didn't pay them their salary for three months. So they actually started to organize. You need some brand secretary, Sandy D, called stepping in, and in a matter of weeks, they got their salary back. But actually, they thought that, that something was possible in there. If they organize and they unite, so something can be done. And since then, uh, uh, the movement on the SOAS cleaner have grown continually. 
In 2008, they won the London Living Wage and the union recognitions, but that was not enough for them. They actually decided to go for more. Uh, so they continued, they continued the campaign for better working conditions. And in 2011, they shifted the campaign to be brought back in house. Everyone was quite surprised at how these uh, uh, foreigners, these migrant workers come over here pretending to be brought back in house. But I said, we don't care what you think. We deserve that. We're going to continue fighting about that. And one of, the, one of the most important things is the solidarity among the cleaners and, and the, the level of organizations. This was unbelievable, and it actually shows, and it, it shows what can be achieved if you actually are determined to have improvement on your terms and conditions. And it also shows how important solidarity across different movements are. The students at SOAS were fantastically supported of the campaign, and also uh, the, the, the lecturers and the SOAS staff. Of course, the managers, they didn't want it, anything to do about it. So during, during the course of this campaign, the SOAS managers have always washed their hands off, saying that's not our problem, that's not our dispute. You work for ISA, you don't work directly for SOAS. I said, yeah, that's the problem. The problem is like you are actually outsourcing them, and we want them to be part of this community and don't be treated, uh, uh, that they feel discriminated against, but treated different. Well, during the years, there was fruitless negotiations, and so the cleaners decided to, to, to go to strike. They were balloted, and they voted, 100% voted yes to go to strike actions. And that showed, that, that showed how they feel. They feel like they could actually change, that change was possible, and actually did manage to achieve change. They went to strike on the 21st, they went to strike on the, on, on the third, four, on the 4th and 5th of, of March, and then they went to strike again on the 21st. And so as make it really clear, this is not our dispute, this is not our problem, this is ISS problem. And if we recall what SOAS attitude toward the cleaners has been during the years, it's quite shocking for most of the people. A couple of months ago, SOAS set up a, a subcommittee in order to assess the feasibility to bring the cleaners in house, but the cleaners were not allowed on the table. So for example, on the table, you can use your representatives, student union representatives, and union representatives, but not the cleaners. They couldn't dare to look at the cleaner side and say, I'm treating you different, and they're going to continue to treat them different. So that's why Unison pulled up of the meeting and said, no, we're not going. We're going there with the cleaners. No, we're not going with the cleaners. And this is, uh, and this is quite important what happened now at the moment. Uh, after, this, after the third strike, ISS called to uh, negotiations. But actually, we as a Unison would impose the conditions of the cleaners being at the meeting themselves. So they no longer could they longer they no longer could be avoided. So we tried to give voice to them. So they were on a negotiation table with the ISS, all these big big uh, big bosses. The same bosses who the day before they went to strike, they came they came to saw at six o'clock in, in the morning to intimidate them. They said that there were no intimidation. They were just explaining them the legal consequences of going to strike. Uh, for example, they will lose the London living wage. That's nonsense because Unison have an agreement with SOAS regarding the, the, the London living wage and not with ISA. So whatever happened in London living wage will stay there. So anyway, the cleanup went to strike. And a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, 10 days ago, we got a phone call from ISS presenting a new offer. That the third offer was on the table before where the previous one were rejected by the cleaners. So that, that offer actually, uh, um, <clears throat> actually lead to a um, great improvement on the contractual terms. The cleaners were always fighting for being brown house and being quality on the terms and conditions. Well, so we are a lot more closer to what we were before. And that's the reason why the cleaners accepted the, the offer. And however, the struggle doesn't stop here. We continue fighting for equality. We continue fighting for equal terms and conditions at those who are directly through university. But nevertheless, it's a massive improvement on terms and conditions. We move into pension schemes. We move into uh, sick pay from day one. And we move also from holiday to entitlements. So it's a, it's a massive achievement. It's a massive achievement. But years ago, they were considered as uh, invisible people, migrant workers who no one care, and they're vulnerable. Well, I, I would like to ask you, do they look vulnerable to you? It's a massive organization, 100% of, of unionized workers over there are going to strike for three days, achieving a massive improvement on terms and conditions, and they realize they don't stop. They continue fighting, and they will continue fighting for, for, for equality. And that's a message, the one we need to put forward. I believe that the campaign is an inspirational campaign for two particular options, for two, two particular things. One is, 
It shows that if we are well organized and you are determined to achieve something, you can do it. So it's, it's a call to every movement who actually is, is currently organized. For example, we went on Saturday to support the, the Care UK employee who has been on a strike, you know, to show them solidarity that is possible. Get organized and be there to man and keep forward, and also for all of us to show solidarity to them. And the second, more important point is, this is a message for all the conservatives and all you kids and, and all those, the ones we don't actually want to talk about it, but they actually have to face the reality in here, that the soil cleaners are migrant workers, and they are here to stay, and they are here to challenge the structure of the system who actually is oppressing all of us. So we need to show solidarity with this movement, and changes are possible. So change. So we're going to move on to questions and contributions and experiences uh, directly relating to what the, those two speakers have talked about, and then we'll go on to that uh, speak. So you have a question and answer. To then these me. two, and then you. Okay. Yeah, I told you that before. Well, I didn't hear it properly. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll just have a, um, a discussion um, about the issues that have been raised there. If you can indicate that you want to speak, and I will. Note, note you down. Um, anything, like I said, anything that you want to talk about, um, but try and keep it brief so that everybody's included. And um, yeah, okay. Um, hi, yeah. Um, uh, my name is Philip Clayton. I'm from Left Unity. I'm a candidate for Barnet for the local council election. So I just wanted to make a couple of comments about what the gentleman was saying about immigration. Um, I was involved with Rock Against Racism and a load of other stuff back in the 80s and the Anti-Nazi League and a load of other stuff and I remember in Lewisham, which I was living in at the time, the National Front had become very, very popular and there was a very big danger that they were going to get their first council seat. And there was a huge campaign, that was, that's when the Anti-Nazi League was started, and at some point before the elections they split. <coughs> and it's because of the split they didn't get any councils elected. Now, what was interesting, if you bear with me, what was interesting was that the Council for Racial Equality, as it then was, did some analysis of who were the supporters of the National Front. <coughs> And they found it was largely the white Irish working class. Now, when you think of all the discrimination they received throughout history, you'd have thought they might have had some sympathy with immigrants. And one of the things that I've noticed, as research has shown at the moment, is all the anti immigration feeling that's being fostered. Uh, particularly by the Tories and UKIP, is not confined to white people. There's now a lot of evidence to show that a lot of black third generation and Asian third generation are having the same um, um, what, discriminatory uh, thoughts against immigrants coming in. Well, so, there, there's some research, there's, there is some research, and the third generation of Asians in this chapter here, they, they are also having these same, expressing these same anti immigrant sentiments. So, it's not just a colour thing, it's not just a. What it is, it's the way capitalism divides and rules. And at the bottom of it, when you talk to people, the thing that comes up again and again and again and again and again when you talk about their anti-immigrant feelings, talk to people about it, housing is always the number one. The lack of it. We're two million houses short in this country and lack of jobs. It's housing unemployment. When people have houses and when they have employment, this anti-immigration thing subsides. It's a way of diverting people to an outside group and not actually getting to look at what the real problem is, which is the neoliberalism. Thank you. Yeah, um, 
this gentleman is absolutely <coughs> spot on. In, our, in, in the area that I live in, Brent, um, we recently had UKIP canvassing around our area. And um, I was so surprised that they weren't only getting uh, attraction from the white uh, people of that area, but my Asian yeah. neighbours and my black neighbours were saying what the likes of Nigel Farage is saying is spot on. One person said to me, and he's my neighbour and I know him for a very long time, he's like, by voting UKIP, we can stop the Romanization of this area. <coughs> also, the other day, um, before I had, you know, headed to work, there were a couple of you know, boys that I knew from school. You know, it was mixed, Asian, black, and, you know, Asian, black, white. Um, they were smoking weed, and I, I just said to them, look, can't you get a job or anything? Uh, they're like, oh, we, we, took our CV to, we took our CVs to Matlin, and um, all we saw was Romanians. All we saw was Romanians and Eastern Europeans working there. And uh, they're, like, uh, they're like, listen, when the Euro elections comes and the general elections, we will be putting our vote for UKIP. And when they saw, I mean, some of them actually saw Nigel Farage versus Nick Clegg in the TV debates, both in the LBC and BBC. A lot of them said that Nick Clegg is a twat, which we know, but they are calling, they are hailing Nigel Farage as a hero, and they said, we will join the People's Army. And this is not only the white people that's doing it, like this gentleman saying, third generation black and Asian people are also supporting UKIP and their xenophobic views. And I'm just thinking, what has the left done wrong? <laughs> Why, why is the right growing stronger and stronger? And now the right is not only attracting white people, they're also attracting third generation black and brown. In fact, my cousin, the other day, when uh, UKIP was around that area, they said he should try to be a local councillor for UKIP. Because he's got a degree of wealth, he thinks that UKIP is suited to people like him. So what this gentleman saying, I, I don't disagree with it, I think he's spot on. I think it's very worrying. It's very worrying, absolutely. I'm absolutely worrying. Um, the guy at the back, let's have a little bit of the uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk a bit about the gentrification that's going on in Tottenham and the kind of the racist ideas and some of the kind of organising and resistance we've put, um, put back. Uh, well, after the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium was supposed to do a regeneration, um, well, that's what they were calling it, and to, in, in doing this, they were going to make millions of pounds, they were supposed to put 16. 16 and a half million pounds back into the community and you know because it's the people that go and watch the football anyway and after the riots happened they pulled out and they said that the council had to go and do this instead now of course the council decided that they were going to do this by selling council homes in, in and demolishing council blocks in the, in the actual area in white Hart lane um and of course there was no uh fixed term tenancies people didn't know where they, where they were going to be moved and we started a kind of a small campaign on the love lane estate and actually managed to get kind of a partial victory on that. Now, the document that came out after the, after the riots um, that was released was called It Took Another Riot. And this was full of the most racist rubbish you've ever seen in your life. You know, kind of Boris Johnson turned up and he was kind of pointing to council blocks afterwards saying, yeah, that one's got to go, that one's got to go with this big shop property developer. And this is a really racist document as well where it says there's too many hair shops of the same kind, there's too many food shops of the same kind. Abs absolute nonsense. Um, so, I mean, that was then. Now, the council's putting in plans to sell off 31 buildings in Harringay. And we're talking Alexandra Palace, St Anne's Hospital. It's bad enough that the, um, the mental health ward has already been moved to Chase Farm or somewhere like that. So you have to, move, you have to go miles. Um, and I think what we need to do is we need to organise ourselves and get involved in these campaigns. I mean, the other one is the Justice for Mark campaign. On, on the actual, we've been leafleting the estate for six weeks with the family, because one of the blocks that they want to um, demolish is Tangemere block on the actual Broadwalk Farm estate, with the family, and we've actually put it in demands um, on the petition, uh, which are, which is demanding a plaque. Now, plaque's a big deal as well to put, to put there, because when they're trying to gentrify an area, they don't want any reminder of, of the criminality they've done, or the execution that's taken place on the farm. Um, uh, a review of the poli uh, policy over stop and search, increase in the budget on uh, youth projects, um, and f uh, for the, the government to express support for the family. So I think the best thing is to kind of, for us, and to fight this aggression is actually like grassroots activism, to get involved in these kind of campaigns. Housing is going to be massive. 
They're trying to gentrify all of London. And we need to start organising and building so we can actually put a fight back. And also, um, also join us on the Justice for Mark campaign as well. It's, it's, it's a sensitive campaign, it's a difficult campaign, but it's something that's very highly political at the moment and it's a way to push any of that kind of racist media, making them out to be a thug, making people out to be gangsters when they're not gangsters, you know, just to cover their own tracks and police brutality. And this is the way they do it. Remember, they, the police come in, stop and search, um, harass people on the estates and try and move the people that live here out so they can move other people in. And we've got to organise ourselves and stop it. And, you know, if, if you can, put your names down, please, on the, on, uh, on, on the desk and we'll, we'll uh, put you on the mailing list for the Fane Council Housing and the Justice for Mark. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I've got the, the two people indicated, and I might not have made it clear to Darkus that, um, that they, we we're going to have such a, a long discussion before we spoke. I'm going to take those two people and then bring Darkus in if that's okay, and let him you know, talk about what he wants to talk about, and then we'll come back and I'll see you with the pink jumper. Um, <coughs> two people, the man at the back and the woman at the Just talking about uh, black people, Asians, even immigrants from Eastern Europe who vote for UKIP or support them, it's not that surprising, but we need to uh, look at the role of alienation in this as well. Um, when uh, Nick Griffin and Andrew Bronze won their seats in the European Parliament um, a few years ago, um, a couple of Asians on the radio spoke from Burnley saying, oh yeah, we voted BNP, we're good British citizens, you know, we're worried about Islam just like you. The, uh, the way alienation affects you, the way um, you have um, <coughs> racism forced upon you from kind of all, all aspects of society and the media and the police really makes a lot of people want to show how they're not like the bad immigrants. This, this is a real phenomenon and it's, and it's disturbing. It's why you have, uh, you know, you have a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of Muslims joining the military, for example, over here and in the United States and you know, flying a flag outside their house showing just how all American they are or how, how British they are. Um, it's, it's like NWA say, don't let it be a black and a white one or they'll slam you down to the street top, black holy shayat for the white cop. This is, <laughs> I think it's really important to see that the lived experience of, 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 of basically having, uh, having dark skin in this country is, is a huge factor and it affects you, I think, very, very seriously when it comes to, um, you know, when you start seeing your neighbours talking about immigration and you think, you know, I'm an immigrant as well. Um, and they say, to, oh yeah, yeah, but you're not like one of those, you know, you, you, <laughs> you speak so well, you know, um, you're not a bad immigrant, and it's something we really have to fight back against, we do have to see that this kind of insidious, um, uh, this, this insidious phenomenon does <coughs> affect people who aren't necessarily the most obvious uh, supporters of the far right, and then we should see UKIP as a manifestation of the far right as well. And then we've got lots more time for, uh, for more discussion. Um, yeah, just, just following on from that, I think that's a, that's a good point. And the way that um, the state has made the good immigrants versus bad immigrants, um, good Muslim versus bad Muslim, um, you can be part of our state-sponsored you know, multiculturalism, but you, like the rest of you, you're not, um, is part of that. Um, and part of that way that people feel they need to somehow show that they are that, that good immigrant. Um, and I think Nigel Farage, he plays this whole, like, I'll drink a pint down the pub um, like you, I'm normal like you, and I, and I hate all politicians like you do, um, is why he has such resonance with people, why people think, yeah, I'll vote for him, because he's, he's like me, he's, he's annoyed with people like me, he's not a normal politician, um, uh, and, and, you know, they can feel like they can relate to that, um, and that's what we need to smash through, really. Um, and I thought that the clip that was in the, the video that was made with Douglas Howell for this meeting, the clip that was in it where the newsreader said to um, Nigel Farage, do you agree with this? Yeah, that's Enoch Powell. Um, that, that's a really good thing to you know, show people, like this is the same politics, this is the same viciousness that your parents had to face, um, and that like your neighbours had to face at that time, this is the same thing coming back again. Um, so I think that that is a big part of like the campaign that like we can um, have around the around the elections in May um, to show what their politics actually is. 
and um, you might have seen the campaign has gone around like defacing their posters. I think we should produce alternative posters. We should um, be knocking on doors and like trying to smash the idea that um, that he's a nice guy like the rest of us. Um, so. Thank you. Yes, I thought I was going to speak after him. Right, I'm sorry. But since you demoted me, I, we don't see you invite. Right. Put on a pedestal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. Would you like to speak now for 20 minutes? Yes. I arrived in this country in April 52 years ago. I have a wife, children, five of them, and seven grandchildren. I am not flitting from tree to tree. I have made up my minds about a lot of things, and so my children have. When I came here, I was about, what, 18 years, 17 years old? I never left Trinidad before that. Uh, my uncle was here, a man called C.L.R. James. I don't know if any one of you ever heard of him. That's my uncle. And uh, I left a country that had now negotiated independence by the British. We had huge demonstrations in the campaign for independence. We cited across the continents to India, and they didn't get that independence that easily. So we were preparing for it that the British would come down to the West Indies with troops as they did in India, as they did in Ghana, as they did in Kenya, and killed a lot of Mau Mau people. So I already had a conception of the British. And I already had a conception of the difference between classes in England. We tried to build Labour Party passes. Before that, we, we built had general strikes and stuff, and the Navy pulled up in the harbor of Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm not talking about some little racial issue between white and black. I'm talking about a time when the whole world was being transformed, and that black people, slaves, ex-slaves, had come to the front and said, we are going to be independent, or will this world will not have peace at all? I want to go back. For you. I want you to listen to me keenly, too. I fell from the comfort of my mother's womb on the 26th of February, 1943. And on that day, they executed a lot of gypsies in Germany. Every day as a child, I grew up hearing about the war that killed 45 million people between 1958, 1938, and at the end of the war. 45 million people were murdered and executed and bombed. And that's the world I grew up in. That's the world my parents tried to explain to me about. And I remember at 4 o'clock every day, we had to keep very quiet in our home. My father was a headmaster, my mother was a headmistress, and then he became a canon in the Anglican Church. And I said, Dad, why do you all listen to the radio at this time every day? And the voice came, this is London calling. <laughs> this is the voice of the BBC. So I said, well, why are we, 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 we so keen on that? He said, there are thousands of West Indians who died in that war. Thousands of West Indians died in the war. Increasingly, thousands died in our movement for independence. And you know why we came to this country? The British used to advertise it on that same BBC program wanting workers to be um, on the in, uh, transport workers, some factory workers, make sure that you are literate. 
and we were asked, invited to come to England. And you talking that, what you just spoke there about Farage? Farage has no chance. He's babbling in entities all across this island and taking money from, took money from the EEC, the EU, in, in, that came out two days ago. He took money from there as, a, what you call it, expenses. And he stole thousands upon thousands upon thousands. I've lived here for 52 years and I do not believe with the working class also in a difficult position and the position we are in. I do not think he can win any victory in this country politically at all. He's a loudmouth babbler, and he is not going to win his own seat in any election. And I, I, I believe that profoundly, because I was an, I'm an activist, so I'm not listening to two friends talking about it. I talk to white working people, and I know, I trust the English working classes to a great degree, and no. If they back down and have this man coming to govern, they have nothing at all left. He's not a trade unionist. He's anti-feminism. And he's a thief. This is a sophisticated country. You think Farage could be prime minister here? I will eat my hat. <laughs> if he becomes that seasoned with West Indian pepper sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so don't elevate him to what he is not. He's a babbler. That's the first point I want to make. That racism is deeply in the DNA of colonial nations. It's in the journey. Uh, Britain shall never be slaves. That's in that journey. The ruling classes of this country have a record behind them of dead bodies all over the world. In the anti-colonial um, struggle, you killed a lot of Indians. In Ghana, those who fought in the World War, a handful of them, went to the government's house to protest as they can't get work, and they killed all of them. The governor and his, his British army. That is what we have to accept, so we know where we have come from, and we know where we are going. 52 years. You weren't born yet since I came to this country. I speak English speak it well, being a journalist and an author and stuff, I could write well. I still have my dictionary when I first went to Queen's Royal College in Trinidad. So I could find words and stuff and stuff. But I'm pleased to come here. I'm not inviting you because I might get locked up in the next week or so to see I incited people in a room in North London. <laughs> I have never been from 1971, I have never been not on bail for the next 10 years. And you know, I, I, my father heard I was arrested for inciting people to kill police officers, and he just sat in the pulpit and took the, he said, hey, that is not my son. That was a final statement. You can't take frivolity and manufacture from that that we ought to free, be afraid of. The English people, not, not, they've been through too much for that. And I know that. Juries let me go a plenty, made up of all white people for inciting a riot, causing an affray, assault on a police, and the rest of it. But there is something of of the British working class is that if we do not respect it, we better put our hands and surrender and walk away. 
And that is where I learned politics. They, they, that's where I learned campaigning. That's where I lost my humility for British justice. It is in this country that I know how a society is organized, the classes, and the only thing that we're in difficulty with, and I'm going to end now, is parliamentary democracy really democracy? Is it? You remember the Greek city-states? Tiny, tiny little islands with Plato at the street corner holding forth and breathing the ideas of democracy. I don't believe that in Britain any people here will, will concede di diplomacy for some totalitarian nonsense. We kill 45 million people to fight totalitarianism. They kill 45 million people, Hitler and his bunch. And there's a tremendous fight from England. The working classes of England I respect. The, work, the black working classes in the United States I respect. I respect the French revolutionary taste I respect. So I don't come here to hang my head at, like Tom Dooley and make you worry that perhaps we're heading into a pre precipice. I believe we are on the verge of a new democracy that is much more democratic than the parliament. Because now you, they get some, what they get? Expenses? A steal it and go running on. That has to go. The Labour Party has to go. Yeah. <laughs> and not being given any money by workers. The trade unions, the working classes have to build a new democracy from below. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. And elevating Farage and you, Christian, you, you attacking him, he, that is to elevate yourself by making him into something that he's not. And I've come here because I am a Democrat by instinct. And I do not believe Parliament is the last word in democracy. I do not believe that. And if we think aloud and dry out, bring the British working class to a point where they have to accept that, where they have to tell Ed Melbourne, why don't you go home and sweep your father's yard or something? Ed Melbourne, I have never heard anything like that little boy. He's paid 438,000 pounds to send for America for, what's his name, Axelrod? For so that he could train him to be the next prime minister. Now, what is that? In that, that doesn't sound corrupt to you, or if not, you call a psychiatrist to go and see Melbourne. He is not winning any election in this country. I, again, have a trust in Britain. Once they get that space to build a new democracy with breath and, and intellectual thought, it's, you see, it's, England is a small place, a small island. A small little island, like Greece. They have intellectual range of, we had Shakespeare and all sorts of things we have produced. And you were going to put Farage to break that up? Where you got that from? He's a hustler. He's a hustler. And I believe that the trade union should stop giving the Labour Party any money at all and start to build from below. And a condition of that, I don't want to hear any racism at all. That will be the first charge you will go get a lifetime in prison for, calling somebody a black bastard. We want to cleanse us, cleanse the nation of all these prejudices of race and color and, and, and African and nationalism and all that. We want, we want a democracy. 
that will make the world tremble and rid the world because it, it has to be not only here, the vanguard for Europe. And there's enough in our history to do that. We reduce the kings from powerful people and queens to nothing. We just keep quiet. Charles and Elizabeth. And so they keep quiet. They say, sign here for this law, they sign. Reduce from absolute power to nothing. Is that not so? The kings ruled exclusively. And now this set of kings in parliament is stealing money, they're talking crap, they're bringing people from America to, to uh, win an election for them in England. Hey, what is that? I would be ashamed to tell my grandchildren that, and I have grandchildren. I, I, I wouldn't want them to, I wouldn't want to die and leave for them the burden that is a parliament of special interests. Do you understand what I'm talking So, my dear, I have delivered. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like you to come back again a bit later yeah. and maybe talk to us about your role in the way that black people did fight back and came on the streets, like particularly with the New Cross fire yeah. and the Black People's March in 1981 mm -hmm. and your role in that. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk about that now or wait until other people have spoken, but I'd like to just to know that was a powerful movement and we've somehow <coughs> got to feed off that and remem remember the history. Would you like yes. to talk about that? Would you like some of the people to talk first and then come yes. back on it? Yes, yes. Yeah. You want me to talk now? It's up to you. I don't know. Talk now? Yeah. yeah. I um, when there was the uprising in Tottenham, that was coming years ago. If you remember uh, when Sil Cotton they got arrested, that was coming years ago. For me, it was inevitable, and they made a serious mistake. All the, and it was a fight to the finish. They called me to come up and speak. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to be responsible, be responsible. Because I've been very lucky, you know. As Zarkas opens his mouth, you see at the front of the Times of one of these pieces of rag that Zarkas Howell caused a lot of trouble. They blamed me for the mangrove demonstration. And I 55 days in the Old Bailey. A policeman stopped me too uh, in Oxford Circus. I went to buy a pair of shoes. And saw, said they saw me dipping my hands in people's pockets and attempting to steal that, ended up in the Old Bailey, won the case. They, like, they used to just say, well, let's go and give Darker some more difficulties. And uh, that solidity I got from the fact that Caribbean peoples are arguably one of the most revolutionary peoples mankind has ever known in the modern world. <clears throat> We defeated the French, the Americans in Haiti, and declared independence and end brought slavery to an end. And you go to Haiti and you see the degradation to which it has descended. And I am becoming alarmed from time to time that if you don't intervene at the right time, you will end up descending into Hades. If you don't do it and you start to make rationale for this and apology for that, you are, we are in deadly trouble <clears throat> because I'm not going back to the West Indies to live. <clears throat> Aeroplanes are disappearing in the air. With all the modern technology, the, a boat which some, they said the captain was not on the front of the boat. That killed a lot of people. In uh, that place, Syria, they killed 500 children with siren gas on a morning. We have to ask what kind of place we're living in. What is this world we're living in? And what can we do to make it much more democratic? And I have shaped my activity in that de de uh, thing. They killed 15 children in New Cross. 
Mrs. Thatcher and the lady the Lord, from the House of Lords were going around saying West Indians are making too much noise and blah, blah, blah. And a man with a Jaguar got out and bonfired a house in New Cross. And they came to me and some people I used to campaign with and stuff. So, and I, I just put the idea for a national demonstration. And that if we do not get 20,000 people, we are in a lot of trouble. We got 24. And we took, you could not, you weren't allowed the police to take a demonstration across the river. From South Africa and South demonstrating in South London. And we went up. And I hired, the, or my organization hired a big truck, massive truck, brought that demonstration over the Thames. And we came in. And at the end of the demonstration, that newspaper, Daily Mail, that nonsense, that is barbarism, said, dark as how, they asked me, well, what do you think? I said, well, it's a good day. I didn't want to be boasting. And that is something quite English, isn't it? It's a fine day. <laughs> and on the following day, the headline, a policeman had a, his hat on and you've seen blood coming out in a still photograph. You know, that is a, I saw that picture in another paper <coughs> some years ago. He just went in there and said, Jack, I see that this policeman. And then I saw we again are in serious trouble. That is what the Daily Mail did. If you read it, if I read two papers every day, the Daily <laughs> Mail, to see what the enemy say. <clears throat> and the Guardian, which still maintains a certain instinct for democracy. So I hear um, <clears throat> we, we are in a moment of change. <clears throat> and one of the most interesting things is that we don't know. <clears throat> we don't quite know. How do we get that in our heads? That's why I came here, to speak in this mood and in this uh, And you helped me get there pretty quickly with this Farage thing. Easier. <laughs> I, I don't support him. <laughs> no, you don't support him, but you, you brought him up. <laughs> you put him on the table. <laughs> I leave all South London in Norbury to come up here to talk about Farage, you. You refer Farage, it's you who got that in my head. <laughs> and I'm going to go back and tell my wife, anytime I see anything about Farage, throw a bucket of ice water on my head. Because <laughs> I would need rescuing. Uh, the other point I, I, I would like, Britain, England is one of the most nationalist places um, I've ever been. And part of the tone, toning down that, is the amount of immigrants who live here. <coughs> because England rules the waves and stuff. That. We didn't come to stop you talking that crap. What we did is being ourselves. We have made an impact on England way beyond anybody imagined. So I don't run around talking racism. When I speak it, I mean it and I'm ready to do something about it. And, and the, the English, I speak English. I don't speak any English. I can say, away go on, sir. That is like a Scotsman speaking English with an accent of a different kind. And I think we have made a tremendous contribution to revolutionizing the spirit of old England into new England. We are part of that. And when, you know why some of them get so racist? They're terrified that we are. And uh, I, finally, I would say, there is something called the Notting Hill Carnival. That is absolutely spontaneous. I was the chairman of the Carnival Development Committee. And you tell me, anywhere, in any part of the modern world, you begin, let's say, and in far, so get some music and come on the road and a chip and a drive and a chip and a drive. And in no time at all, two years, a million people turned up on the streets of Notting Hill. They came from Germany. Have you come to the carnival here? Yes, I've been there. Yeah. Notting Hill gate streets. And it's a, 
and now they're trying to ban it. So there is a liberating impact that we have made on England in the same way that England has made an impact upon us for Little Island to win a war with Hitler and the rest of them. So there is a duality. You owe me for bring, clearing up the, the, the rusty nonsense that comes to the English mind sometimes, as well as I owe you for joining the world of reason in a language which we were born with in Africa or India, and we could speak what we feel and not what to say. You gave us, you gave us um, Shakespeare, and I can still recite sonnets. You'd weep and say, where is that Negro coming from, Trinidad and Tobago? And cricket. <laughs> I'm finishing now. <laughs> <laughs> That game went all over the world, and England ruled the waves. And then came a team from tiny little islands in the West Indies, which spanked England from Jolly Grove to Langsend. So we in this, we are like husband and wife. We in this, we in this, and we not in it. And, and I want a divorce now. I don't want to give you a divorce anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why were you unfaithful to me? You know, well, I wasn't, you know, I just like Germany a little bit. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I'm not a comedian. That beautiful dialectic in the relationship between England and, uh, and black people in Africa, particularly in the West Indies, because they speak the same language, did the same books in school, it's a bit difficult to get it with Islam, but you will. And this I leave in a speech now by saying, my days, uh, I look forward to every day. I seek to see how, how, how are we doing with each other. Do you understand that? <coughs> and that is, once you start there, racism is finished. Thank you very much. We'll open it to the floor again, and I'm sure people are going to want to make general points, and I'm sure people have got specific questions they want to ask any of our speakers. Um, I'll take the lady in the pink jumper first, because you indicated okay. before. Okay. Well, um, uh, it was good to hear Darkus is cheerful. I mean, I'm not always uh, cheerful when I see what goes on in the world, but it was interesting and you know, encouraging to hear that you are still optimistic. Um, but the reason I put my hand up actually was to um, answer somebody who spoke earlier. You know, you said, um, what has the left done wrong if um, lots of people, including black nation people, believe in UKIP? Well, you know, I'm sure we could have a long discussion about all the weaknesses of the left. But I do just think that one thing we need to pay more attention to actually is precisely the Daily Mail and similar papers. I mean, I know, you know, there are people who deconstruct what they say, but I just think it is one of the things we should pay quite a lot of attention to, um, you know, busting the myths, because I don't rule that often, but, you know, when I do the, the mail or the sun or what have you, you know, I can see it's full of poison generally, and very little news in it, actually. Um, and it's like... Um, a twin, actually, of the ruling class. I mean, the people who run papers like the Mail are not mostly in government, and they don't necessarily have quite the same views or agree with everything. But nonetheless, those privately owned by very rich people, those right-wing papers, are there all the time. And, you know, if you think back to maybe 15 years ago, they were full of file, day in and day out, about asylum seekers. And all that sort of stuff is bound to have some effect. Um, particularly if people are under a lot of pressure from whatever quarter. Um, so a lot of the nonsense that's in there becomes common sense for some people unless they meet something or talk to somebody that reminds them that it is nonsense. I just think that is one thing that we should pay more attention to myself and making what we say accessible because often the left is very 
you know, in what terms and uses jargon and all the rest of it. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Chuckett. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't want, I hope, that um, Darkness doesn't have to beat his hand <laughs> with or without um, flavouring. Or, 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 have, or have I stuck it thrown at it? But um, I think I have to come a little bit to your defence um, that I think it would be wrong just to write off Farage as a clown. Because there's a very solitary lesson, I think, from Germany. In Germany in the 1930s, or 1920s rather, had one of the most advanced, sophisticated, working, um, working classes, working class movements, working class organisations, big lot of culture, you talked about Shakespeare, you talked about Beethoven, um, and they had a babbler, um, like Farage, um, worse than Farage, a lot worse than Farage, and one could have said at one stage, it was inconceivable, of a man like Hitler to be coming to power. And I don't actually think Farage is going to come to power. But I think you can't write off... Somebody the behind you, so you're still... Yeah. I think you can't, you, you can't, um, you can't dismiss the battle um, when, when, it, when their moment can come. I think his moment has come, not a bit about being a prime minister, but about shaping disproportionately um, the, the political climate that we're in. I mean, these elections that are coming up are going to be, or are likely to be, a carnival of reaction. Mm -hmm. It's going to be full of crap. It's going to be full of, of, of every newspaper, every political part, mainstream political party anyway. Um, every street corner, there are going to be people saying the opposite to what we're saying. They're going to be saying immigrants are the problem. We're going to hear this day in, day out. Farage is leading, is, is leading the charge but all the rest of them uh, are, are, are chiming in and, uh, and, and are saying that. And I think it's, that's why I think this, it's really great that this meeting has been called around this thing, because, because we have, because of the likes of Farage and so on, we have to be out there, somebody has to be out there, actually saying, um, standing up for migrant rights, actually saying that immigration controls are a lot of the problem, so that um, you know, it's a weapon for, for, for the ruling class to be able to say, these people are illegal, you're not, divide and rule, these people can't organise it, if they try to, we'll smash them and deport them, etc. It's immigration controls that are the problem, it's, um, and of course it's capitalism that is the problem. But we are, we are facing massive people saying the opposite, and, we, and these next month is going to be um, hugely difficult, which is why... He is a clown, but he's a very dangerous clown. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The guy at the back, the black jacket. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, I came to send a message from um, London Anti-Fascist and Anti-Fascist Network uh, in solidarity with North London RS21. Um, I'd like to tell you about the demonstration against the March for England happening on um, Sun this Sunday. Um, and I think it, play, it, 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 it it links up really well to what's, what's been said today. Look at how, I think personally, we've had no counter to the way in which Labour fell when the Tories were elected. And since then, people today ask themselves, every, tell themselves today, every single party has basically you know, sold us out. What am I going to vote for now? Oh, UKIP comes along. And UKIP is completely sweeping up the ground. I was um, at home in West London the other day and a Lib Dem, ex Lib Dem councillor, an Asian woman who was a councillor for 18 years knocked on my door and I started speaking to her about EMA and the way in which the Lib Dem sold out in 2010 and the tuition fees. But she said, you know what the real problem is? The real problem is, is those fucking Polish, you know? I, and, I, and I looked at her and I said, you, you are a prefer, perfect example of the way in which politicians play people against each other. It's like, no, 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 us as Asians, we came to work here in the 30s, we built this nation. We have a right here for our children. But those Polish and those Ukrainians, all those other people, they come here, they don't work. In fact, they feel they have a sense of pride and they, they want to <coughs> snub all of us. I think the way in which, the, way in which the, 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 the shift to the right, not just here, but across Europe, and we're experiencing it now, is having an absolutely horrific effect. There are deportations happening all the time. 
there are the specific gender and racial effects of people who go to the job centre and get and get um, what's it called docs and they get penalties and that kind of stuff because of the way in which the, the government is pressuring every single way in which the the, the state is the, at the state level all of the services are now coming down and affecting people really specifically. Um, I don't think I don't think Naraj, uh, Farage will be the next Hitler, but what it actually is doing really badly and really well for them is is that is capitalising on an absolute ferment among far amongst disgruntled English working class and black working class and Asian working class people together. People are disillusioned across the horizon. So we need to, we need what we have to look at is the way in which the left can play a role and not and get away from the way, way in which we compartmentalise every single struggle. Today, the struggle happens across the board and we have to think about dynamically how is it we can create these massive, magnificent left organisations that were in the 70s and that were in the 80s but no, that are no longer today. And that starts at, at the ground, analysing what is happening, you know, festering, manifesting and the mechanisms in which you know, what is happening among working class people today. Dark has talked about you know, the way in which traditions in the Caribbean you know, great absolute revolutionary fighters. They don't take they don't take crap. And how is it then if they come here and these people from India, from Asia, from Africa that face absolutely repressive conditions against the government, far worse than any of us have probably ever experienced. How is it in which they can feel so atomized in this country not to do anything? I think that one of the downfalls and one of the, the things bad, bad things we can end up doing is seeing that they have no sense of agency and no sense of power. These are very powerful, resistant people. And we as people from the left who politically have a wealth of language, of knowledge, of education, which they come to me and tell me, why can't you go and do this? Why can't you just call a protest? If I, you have democracy. You know, I can't do this because I can't speak English very well. I can't do this or that. It's very simple things in which, you know, people in my family tell me, people, every immigrants, migrants, they always say these things. We have what it takes to basically ferment the, the working class and we have to play a role in which links up all of those struggles. It's not on behalf of them or it's not to substitute, sub, act as substitution, uh, substitute for them, but it's to actually play a role in which it unites all of that and pulls it together. And that requires going deeply into where people live every single day and that involves knocking on those doors every single day, like, ground, like harrowing work, not a way, not a way in which um, you know, we can sometimes be attracted to magnificent sort of broad overall um, glossy campaign uh, publications or banners or these kinds of things. They are needed, but you, what you have to first have is substance, not the empty shell. Thank you. There's been very few women speakers, so I'm going to take them from the back of the hat on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's in Brighton. We have coaches Brighton. leaving from New Cross. It's five pound return. Uh, we'll be leaving in the morning, and we'll come, be coming back about seven pm in the evening. Nine am. Yeah. So yeah, I've, I'm really glad to be following Arnie's contribution, actually, because what I wanted to say was quite similar in the sense of needing to collect, collect the struggles. Because I think one of the things that we're seeing at the moment is the way in which. Um, People on the right and people in, you know, the the, 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 large, the the politicians basically are able to fester racism by playing off different press groups against each other. Um, so, for example, you know, you've got Ofsted going into schools asking Muslim teachers whether they're homophobic or whether they accept gay people, and then that being publicised widely in the media. You've got the EDL not too long ago having like try, uh, attempting to have a, a pride march um, in London, um, and you've got the whole this the fanaticism around the veil that was kicked off earlier, um, earlier, I think it was this year. And I think this is also reflected in, in the way in which feminism has grown as well. So you've got aspects of mainstream feminism now, um, and it's good to see feminism on the up again and you know starting to research, but you've got um, very prominent aspects of it who take quite Islamophobic um, views uh, about you know, the relationship between women and Islam, and you've got um, you know LG, people in LGBT politics as well who are buying off these ideas and see Muslims as a problem rather than assimilation and the pink pan. Um, so I think you know there is a backlash to this. There is like the rise of black feminism and ideas like intersectionality, which is good. But I think we have to play more of a role. Members of RS21 and you know, members of left unity and people on the left in general need to take more role 
of thinking about the way in which racism works in the context of other oppressions and you know counteracting the narrative that Britain is this all liberated place contrary to these immigrants who are coming in and um, defying our laws of liberalism because at the end of the day if you look at what is actually happening under austerity Britain look at what's happening in Yarlswood um, immigration centre look at what's happening with the fact that immigration laws are so tight for domestic workers that if they come over here and work they can't actually leave um, the people that they're working with and it ends up a situation where uh, they could actually end up domestic slaves and that's happening in the UK and I think we have to expose that actually if you want to find the sexist, if you want to find the homophobes, if you want to find the racist, look at the Tories, look at UKIP and um, we need to play more of a role on the left in making sure uh, that immigrants are not played off against other oppressed groups and I think that's one way that you can try and unite the struggles that Arnie was talking about. Because you have already spoken, and we need to finish the, the discussion at quarter two so we can bring the speakers back. So I'll take the man in the um, maroon. Okay. Um, question uh, for you, You made um, uh, reference to uh, the events of summer 2011 after Mark Dillon was killed. And, uh, and rep uh, I made reference to? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the uprising of 2011 after Mark Dillon's death, after Mark Dillon's murder. Yeah. And uh, you know, with, you know, young people sort of erupt you know, in anger, all, all, all that. And one, I mean, it is true that a lot of people believe, a lot of young, they end up believing a lot of propaganda and a lot of things that aren't true. But one of the things that I found interesting about that right is when I ask a lot of the young people, why, why, why did you do it? Why did you get involved? The number two, uh, the number one and two answers were well, well, because copies of us and stories of us. Um, so it is true actually that. that uh, it, I mean, it is actually also true that a lot of them do know kind of their politics, they kind of do know what they want to do. Uh, my question to you would be, you know, you know somebody who, who had to, yeah, you know, had to deal with people, you know, had to, all most people who've been, you know, similar, similar situations, and how can we reach out? How can we reach out to those young people now? How can, how, can we, how can we help them build something from below? The, the first thing, I mean, the only, the first thing, you have to listen to what they have to say. You have to be able to connect, um, connect that with their history. The history of children as a group of Caribbean peoples or some African peoples or so on. So you have to know that. You cannot go to them. I warn you of it, saying, well, I've got the right answer. Would you follow me and join my vanguard party? <laughs> they will tell you to go to hell. I know that. I listen to them. I listen to my grandchildren. And my father never used to listen to me at all. It's one thing I've learned here in this country, in the thick of the struggles that I've been involved in, is to listen and to interpret and to look with a discerning eye. Otherwise, you go to them with something and you don't know who you're speaking to. You say it's the wrong language. And you, you, you understand what I'm telling you? And I, I've organized and brought out the biggest demonstration the black communities have had in this country. <clears throat> and we did that with one in 10. I went to Liverpool. Each one, you get 10 people specific, specifically plucked, and each one had to go to 10, another 10. And then the, the third batch, and so they went on and on and on. And when they left Liverpool, they left with four buses to come to London. I did not even know there were black people in Preston. And one of my little friends from Liverpool, he says, Mr. Howe, go to Preston, man. They have a lot of friends there. I said, well, that you in the 10? Yes. I said, well, you take your 10 of them and go and make another 10. And when, when, when the police saw the size of the demonstration, as it came out of Lucian and over the bridge, he says, fuck me. That is dark as how again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. come back again in a bit. Guy with the green T-shirt. Um, on the question of uh, <coughs> optimism and confidence, I think I think this is an important point here because let's just think about what, what was going on with the incidents with the councillor and Arnold just now. Why is it that Asian councillor said, "Oh well, you know these poles coming over here, they don't work properly"? Why was she saying that to Arnie, an Asian? The reason is she's fucking desperate to get anyone to vote for her, and she'll say whatever <laughs> she thinks is necessary to get that vote. This is what's going on here. The mainstream political parties are using the fear of UKIP to try to stir it. 
And I think that's a much, much bigger issue than UKIP itself. UKIP are not a Nazi organisation. They don't organise violence from the streets. They're a, they're a populist, pujadist outfit. And they're really a product of the entire political class that's um, selling out over immigration and asylum seekers over the past 10, 15 years. You could have risen as a result of that. And the political classes and the media and the Daily Mail use the fear of UKIP to promote them. They present them as this atavistic, irrational force, there's nothing we can do about it, Might have, must have, we've just got to crack down on immigration. So we have to lose that fear of UKIP because the fear of UKIP is part of the problem. The fear of UKIP is what paralyzes. And if we're going to take the argument to them, we have to step up on the front foot. And we've got reason to be confident. I'll, I'll, I'll knock up a couple of kind of piss-stake UKIP um, posters in Photoshop last night. I was mucking about on the web. Social media, Twitter and Facebook are full of parodies of uh, anti-UKIP. Uh, go to ukipsosexy.tumblr.co.com. <laughs> Not at work, yeah? But um, <laughs> uh, if you remember that racist, racist fan go home and the, the, the border stuff that was a few months ago, Farage came out distancing himself from that because he knows, he knows that there is a powerful anti-racist current and tradition in this country. He knows it because he's on the other side. But our side, sometimes we forget this. And I think we, we, we can look at things like uh, go to um, defaced, uh, something like destroyed uh, UKIP billboards.com. Billboards in Chatham, in Kent, are getting defaced. So there is an anger out there at UKIP. There is, people do spot them for, for, the, for what they are. And I think the left needs to mobilise that. We need to kind of actually see that there's people out there. The reason that we keep having these arguments about immigration is that we weren't forceful enough on it 10 years ago. And we need to start making, bring, taking that argument about immigration to the class now. We need to start having rounds with people. Because bear in mind, when people, you get into the argument on the street corner, it's the one racist fuck who's making all the noise. Out of the other five people, three of them in the middle are assigned and just waiting to see which side it is. So if the anti-racists are a bit more confident, articulate our arguments about immigration properly, and take the battle to UKIP, and understand that the battle is actually a battle against the whole political class, we can undermine their anti-political appeal, we can fuck up their racism, and we can create a situation in this country, like you got in the States, where the radical right is this marginalised set of nutters, and it's Occupy-style, Indignado-style movements that rule the streets. Three minutes or less, yes. and then um, we can bring other speakers back. Um, on, uh, of course. Um, one, of the, one of the things is, uh, is not so much foreign people coming here, but foreign capital, um, and that's what's causing most of the problems <laughs> and speculation in the Arabs' market. money. Yeah, it's, uh, as well as the massive amount of money that British people working in banking get paid, thereby excluding all the all everybody else as well. Um, another key factor in, in what is actually happening to us now, I mean, there's an interesting thing that happened in October last year. There was um, an aeroplane that flew for about three hours past its, its destination because the pilot and the co-pilot were both asleep. And you say, well, why is the plane still in the air? Because a computer is flying the plane, and to a certain extent, the pilot and co-pilot have become totally redundant. Um, we've had driverless trains on the Docklands Light Railway, Railway for 25 years, and that, that could be introduced across the whole whole rail network, you know, from British Rail to, through to the underground to whatever, thereby cutting down the number of workers and, and so forth and so on. And there's actually a fascinating thing that was on Newsnight on Tuesday uh, about how robots are, are taking over. So, like, think jobs like long distance lorry drivers may, may, may cease to exist because of that. And I think that, as well as you know, the issue of, around <coughs> things like immigration and, and things like that, the indigenous and uh, immigrant populations fighting like cats in a sack or so, like that, is partly a result of there being more. More jobs for robots, not more jobs for immigrants, but more jobs for robots than there are, you know, and, and this is something, this is a factor that, that affects the working class in a way that it is never, technology has never really done so in such a way before. Thank you. May I, um, I just... You're so coming back in a minute. Just one wait. thing I want to say. 
Go on then. You, uh, that stadium that we had there in the East End for the Olympics, you know who built it? Polish laborers. Polish laborers? Not really Polish laborers, Romanian laborers, and Polish again electricians. We don't have those people here in this country to do that job. You know I know that? I live in Norbury, which is on the road from Brixton to, to uh, Croydon. And uh, my wife and I have a house. And we had to try to do what we wanted with this. And until I met a Polish guy in a pub, and he used to come to work on time. He is slick and neat. He, I will go with him and he will say, buy this, buy that. And I said, well, where did you learn all of this? He said, after that mass movement and the Russians attack and lick away all buildings, they started a new technical colleges to teach them how to put down florins. And in Amai Street now, Everybody, they said, Jacques, where's a Polish guy who's fixing your floor the other day? And they come here and they're doing it. When they were, um, the mothers conceived them, she didn't have to go to any English doctor. The Polish paid for her. When he was born, the, the, the NHS in Poland, that was Poland people. When he landed here after going to technical college and everything, we got him free. He didn't have any, NHS didn't pay for him. School teachers and they got him free. He, he, the, the state never spent any money on his mom or him. He came here a big boy accomplished. So we got him for nothing. And he is working for half the amount of money an English trained carpenter does. That's what happened. And they built that, they and the Romanians. And, and, and let me say one That's last right. thing. The one thing I used to think that the English people were quite polite. Boris never said thank you. And he knows that more than everybody. Ed Bulls, uh, Miliban and Balls, they know that before anybody. <clears throat> but they like to keep their constituencies and constituents in a backward way. And that is the fight that is going on in this country between, you don't have to have demonstrations. The best part of a fight is when nobody knows it's going on. And when you do find out, somebody won. I believe that it's a serious struggle going on. And, but you can only think in the way of Farage. Farage is the backside end of it. He's an idiot. Uh, but a fight is going on quietly inside the working class for a new sense of history. Of that I'm absolutely sure. And I'm not an Uncle Tom who wants to say things to, to, to make white people like me. I don't care. But I'm saying what I know about the history of English, which once ruled the world, have now to transform themselves into giving us an example to America, to all English-speaking countries, to South Africa, if that working class wakes up and stop inhaling bad habits, the drug addicts, the Farage addicts, you want to get rid of him. To listen to Farage, I don't know how you could listen to him. And I've come here and I'm leaving here, and if anybody is going to write an article, say, Darker stands up for England. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Do you understand that? <laughs> Clearly. I'm going to take one more speaker, because this meeting was brought to you by Revolutionary Socialism in the 21st Century. I think this person's got something to say about future meetings. And did you want to come back as well? Did you want to come in as well? Uh, if I can. Yeah, you come first then, and then, and then we should know. finish your yeah. quote. No. Okay, well, I'm not going to talk for a long time. It may be a long question, but it's a question from the speaker. Um, and it arises from Nigel Farage's over a million pound poster campaign against uh, East European Italian immigrants taking uh, jobs, etc. That's been called racist. A couple of you have 
use the word racist, talking about anti-immigrant feeling against white Europeans. And I just want to ask about racism. My impression is it's not respectable to be racist against black people, plus there aren't a lot of them coming over at the moment. Is it racism, as some of the newspapers have said, to uh, this poster campaign? Is that racist yeah. against white people? And if so, is, is the definition wider now? Does it mean anybody from a different country or ethnic group? You know, could make, that would help me when I argue with people about who is and isn't racist and Farage and all the rest of it. Thank you. Oh, okay, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, thanks everyone for coming here as well, just sort of speaking as part of the North London group um, who, who invited you all here. I want to reiterate a point that's come up a, a few times, which is, what is the left going to do? Because frankly, Farage, Cameron, Milbans, they do what we let them get away with. They do what the people and the working classes of Britain let them get away with. Um, I urge everyone to raise their voices as loud as possible, to argue with people, to stick up for each other as well, to say immigrants are not the problem, austerity is the problem, the lords and ladies in, um, in number 10, Farage, a banker, are the problem. Um, in a much more sort of modest arena, I'd ask people, that I think there's a, a sign-up sheet going on, I'd really urge people who haven't been in touch with us yet and come in just for the first time to put down your contact details so that you can be involved in us and so that so that we can be involved with you as well, um, to try and do what we can to, um, uh, to build something of that new movement that we need against racism and some of that new movement that we need for radical change and for socialism. We um, have weekly events, there's these highly attractive leaflets going around. Um, I, I mean, that's I think for me, I guess, we get to the speaker to probably work back on a few things, but um, the main thing is uh, thanks a lot for coming and let's make sure that we actually go out there and make some sort of change as local activists. Thank you. Quick summary from the three speakers. Um, if there are any urgent announcements, I don't know whether we have a tube strike announcement. I didn't hear it. But anyway, could some come back to that. And then it gets better after that because you can go and eat food and drink. And <coughs> there as well. Yeah, you can do it quickly. Um, just, just in a minute. And then. Um, yeah, so if you want to do the tube strike and then we'll come back to it, Mark. Right, I'll, I won't, so I won't talk very long, I've, I've been most people know. Um, uh, the RMT, after um, uh, not uh, managing to, to get Boris to uh, to back down over the closure of ticket officers, which are not just ticket officers, these are the officers that you need to go to if you've got any kind of mobility or any kind of concern on, on you know, using London Underground. These are the only points of contact that any of you as the travelling public have. And the RMT is in the last, last ditch effort to try and stop Boris from reneging on a number of promises he's made over the years and closing a lot of them. Uh, they've resorted to a three day strike action which starts on uh, Monday night. Uh, there will be, uh, the RMT is holding a uh, sort of big set piece um, sort of uh, pickets uh, as, as the action starts uh, at many of the major stations. I haven't got a list yet. Please do check the RMT website. If you can make it down to places like Euston and so on on, on Monday evening and show support, because it really helps them roll station staff if, if, if people come along and, uh, uh, and, and tell them they're supporting. Um, there's a couple of issues that I wanted to, to address. I think the first one is in relation to the media and the, and the particular anti-immigration rhetoric that the media per per perpetrates time and time again. So I think it acts in some way, it acts like the glue of anti-immigration rhetoric. So if you take the example of Gordon Brown's speech in 2007, in which he stated British jobs for British workers, if you read the whole speech uh, in its entirety, it's actually a traditional social democratic speech in which he talks about various apprenticeship schemes, training, uh, training schemes, etc. But the only way that the Labour Party is, is able to play off the Daily Mail is by effectively placing a line in there and mediating itself and saying, well, Gordon Brown will also mention British jobs for British workers, and so he hits, he hits the headlines. And that political opportunism or spinelessness plays itself through and through. If you look at the way that Nigel Farage capitalized on the zero hours, um, the zero, uh, zero hours contract, 
It was like literally, it was never do you hear labor rights or workers' rights being discussed in the mainstream media. However, what happens again is zero hours <coughs> contracts gets into the mainstream media. What does, what does uh, Nigel Farage say? Not I'm going to quit zero hour contracts. No, I'm going to kick out all those Romanian people uh, as a consequence of having zero, zero hours. And so the same thing happened again, and to just give another example, with the BBC, and which is also mentioned in Owen Jones's book, Chaps, where a worker at the Lindsay Oil Refinery says, we're being separated off from the Portuguese and Italians, but the BBC actually spiced it in such a way, and he said, we don't even get into contact with them, actually manufacturing a whole different narrative around the Lindsay Oil dispute, where at the same time there actually are worker struggles that are recurring, that are, and they're never being reported about. At the same time, workers' rights are only being framed in the way if they're able to being used to divide, uh, to divide the, working, uh, the working classes. I think we do have a problem on our hands in so far that there is no viable alternative in the upcoming European Union elections in this country. I do think it's brave and I think it's great that people are defacing UKIP posters, but the question is, is how do we in five years' time have a viable political alternative that is able to use the proportional system that, you ha that we have uh, in the European Union elections to stand viable candidates, to put forward a message, an anti-austerity message, anti-neoliberal message, an open borders message inside of, inside of the European uh, Union uh, elections. I think the uh, one important thing, just to, uh, just to close off with, I think it's as you know the Italians said, given that it's the national day of liberation in Italy today as well, and the 40th anniversary of the Portuguese revolution, so great time to have a meeting. Anyways, <laughs> Antonio Gramsci said, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, and I think Darkus combines you know, the two, and I hope that this meeting <coughs> did its effort in combining the two as well. Yeah, yeah we said a couple of things. I think it's, it's, it's of course, we need to actually mobilize people on the ground in order to challenge uh, the narratives of the UKIP. At the same time, we can, we can actually, we have to use what the migrant workers are using to challenge narr the narratives. They, they come to say that the migrant workers are lowering the, the, the salary of the British workers. Nevertheless, you go all over London, migrant workers, Demonstration is striking for Britain worker conditions, not just for the London living wage, but they go on and they want more. So those who come, to, those, those who come and say, no, migrant workers just take whatever is there. No, when we come in country, I'm, I'm, I'm a migrant worker myself. When I came into this country, then you actually take whatever is there. But then as soon as you became organized, you realize that you got rights. You can't organize, you can't fight back. Then as soon as you realize that you got power, then you do so. And I'm on zero hour contracts, by the way. And I'm not, I'm in zero hour not because I want to be on zero hour contracts, because it has been imposed upon us. And it's so difficult to organize uh, 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 the workers on zero hour contract because that's the whole point of the zero hour contracts, to limit it, the rights of the workers and to prevent them from organizing. But it's not just we are taking what is scam. It, it has been imposed by the system which is taking place. And these statutory uh, uh, laws are not enough. They don't protect the workers as they should be protected. They give you the minimum to leave. But the migrant workers are not accepting that from granted. They are fighting back. And so we need to show, we need to challenge the narrative of the, U, the, of the UKIP and others by showing that the, the migrant workers are fighting and are fighting back and they are winning <coughs> little battles in here and there. But if we actually get, take into account all the little battles they, they are winning a massive battle about massive corporations and about those who actually are the system itself. They say we, sh we should be using all this narrative to, color, to, to encourage people to come on board and to join this movement against, against them. Thank you. Hmm? You've got a few final words for us. You've got three minutes. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, a lot of things that have been going on in my head, I could use them here because there's a whole range of imagination. Because when you're talking about Farage, you're not talking about what he's doing now. You have this imagination that he will emerge like some big lion 
and, and consume all foreigners. You have a, you have a, since you're small, you have a little brother or sister who just like to talk for talk's sake and talk against this crap. That man is not serious. And I find too many of us are making something out of him. Why doesn't he come in the carnival in Notting Hill with a truck and on a, uh, with a tannoy and start abuse West Indian I don't think he'll come out alive, do you? <laughs> Why doesn't he go to Ireland and carry on in the Catholic areas? Do you think he'll come out alive? We tend, I'd say we tend sometimes to overplay these halfwits, and it takes us a long time to know. I know a lot of black people talk that same crap about whites, racist nonsense, and I just keep my mouth shut. I say, save your breath to blow your coffee, you idiot. <laughs> save that. I don't want to hear you with that. And I, um, I, I ban myself from going to meetings lest I get into arguments. But I think I'm slowly changing because I enjoy being here tonight. And I learned a lot. And I did not know that Farage was frightening black people to the extent to frighten you. Tell him to go to hell. So Farage, this is ideology. His ideology is frightening. How could there be an ideology without somebody saying it? In the, Farage is the leader of a, a group of misguided people, and he should just join some, he should just have a little church. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist. So. <laughs> some like a little church. <laughs> and I'm speaking like this. My father was an Anglican priest. So I, and I used to serve at the altar until I broke with my father and became an atheist. This man, for a, I'm, I'm beginning to insist everywhere I go now, he means nothing. I have greater respect for the people of Britain, particularly the working classes, for them to support that idiot. And they supported Ed Miliband now. That's another one. That's <laughs> the next meeting. I, re I remember, oh, last thing. There is a film I was invited to Call, uh, on Wedgwood Ben called Will and Testament. It's a fine document. And we all ended up singing Bread and Roses. And the entire, entire auditorium went up for if Farage dies in the morning and anybody brought out any uh, post-mortem kind of meeting to see some film on him, I think he'll get about 12 people. Wedgwood Ben, when you, you can't use those two words in uh, Ben and Farage. And I'm going to put some, I'm going to tell Mrs. Howe when I go home and my children when they come to see me, I do not want to hear that name called in this house <laughs> ever again. <laughs> I'm banning everybody from coming to my house. But children, I have seven and six grand, 13. And they are, I'm going to ban it. <laughs> His name was not because you're just elevating an idiot who could cause a lot of difficulty <laughs> and petty murders in this corner. But I know I grew in, I was speaking English when I was born. And you know, I could speak a little French there. That idiot, I don't want him, his name called in my house. Again, and the mortgage is already paid. <laughs> you understand? Don't don't have it. Don't no. Do not call his name. We need some posters like that. Give me a bit, yeah. And that's the end of it. We'd like you all to stay. Go and eat the food and drink the drink and get to know each other better. Have you got some red wine there?